good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, whatever part of the world you are in. And uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, lecture in the MMIAS uh, lecture series. This is our second lecture series. Last year, we had a lecture series which was mainly online because we were still suffering the hangover of the from the hangover of the COVID uh, lockdown. But uh, this year, we are hoping to have more offline lectures. This particular one is still online. So welcome to this lecture. And uh, the speaker today is Dr. Manpreet Singh. And she's going to talk on the red turbans of Shanghai from colonial instruments to anti-colonialists. And the focus of her talk is going to be the period between 1885 and 1945, which is of course the uh, colonial period, the high colonial period. Uh, before I hand over the platform, the Zoom platform to Manpreet, uh, a very brief introduction to her. We can go on and on with introducing Manpreet, but it will be a brief introduction. We are very happy to have Manpreet doing this talk with us. Manpreet has been associated with the University of Mumbai as a PhD student earlier. And uh, after that, she has been part of several seminars and conferences and web talks, uh, which we have conducted. She has always been very active, a very active scholar. So let me introduce Manpreet. Dr. Manpreet J. Singh is the author of the book, The Sikh Next Door, An Identity in Transition, a work which probes the Sikh community's diverse historical trajectories, breaks through the stereotypes surrounding it, and recontextualizes it in a contemporary urban framework. This is very important to Manpreet. She's quite passionate about breaking the stereotypes about the Sikh community, whether in India or in diaspora. The book was published by Bloomsbury in 2022, and it has been very well received. Manpreet's MPhil in English was from the Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, and her PhD, as I've already said, was in English from the Mumbai University and focused on Indian English writing, specifically on gender issues, masculinity and femininity in Shashi Deshpande's work. She has previously taught at the Mata Sundari College, Delhi University, and has now relocated to Mumbai as a full-time writer. In 2014, uh, the Indo-Canadian Canadian Study Centre Mumbai awarded Manpreet the South Asia Diaspora Fund Senior Research Fellowship for research on the Sikh community in British Columbia. The research and fieldwork were aided by the British Columbia province and the University of Fraser Valley, Canada. Her report on Sikh diaspora in British Columbia was included in the New Directions in Diaspora Studies, Volume 2, published by the Indian Diaspora Center, University of Mumbai. Indian Diaspora Center was a forebear of this current center, MMIAS, Mumbai Munster Institute of Advanced Studies. She has presented papers on different facets of Sikh identity in national and international conferences. Some of her areas of focus are the staggered Sikh identities in diaspora, the stereotypes within which the community is caught, representatives, representations of Sikhs in national and international cinema, the repositioning of priorities among the Sikhs settled in the West, and the legacies of Sikh genocide in 1984. Her interests center around contemporary literature, gender studies, ethnic identities, popular culture, post-colonial perspectives and their intersections. Her previous works include The Golden Ark, a collection of poems, and two, Male Image, Female Gaze, Men in Shashi Deshpande's Fiction. So I give you Dr. Manpreet Singh. Manpreet. Thank you, Dr. Baruch. Thank you for inviting me for the lecture series. And thank you for introducing me as well. 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to those tuned in from India. Um, it's a pleasure to share with all of you some observations from my study on the Sikh diaspora. Today's focus is on the Sikhs who worked as policemen for the British in Shanghai from 1885 to 1945. Sikh diaspora in the West is already well documented, but there has been much less focus on Sikhs in Singapore, China, etc. Singapore has some coverage, but Sikhs in China are a very uh, less documented aspect. In fact, uh, it was only when somebody from within China decided to look into the Sikh presence in Shanghai that more about it uh, came to the rest of uh, the acad academia as well. So crucial inputs on Sikh presence in China come from a solitary work of research by Professor Sin Yao of Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. And a lot of the insights in today's paper come from his research. Uh, apart from that, there are inputs from uh, centers on Chinese studies in various universities. Uh, studies by scholars who have looked into the role of Sikhs in the British Indian Army and uh, scattered accounts by Indians who happened to visit Shanghai and were intrigued by uh, traces and vestiges of Sikh presence in Shanghai. So if time permits, at the end of the lecture, I would like to take you through a small visual journey of Sikh policemen in Shanghai. Uh, I'll begin with the paper now. In Mandarin, Hong means red and Tao means head. The term Hong Tao gained connotations ranging from fear to derision with reference to burly Sikh policemen sporting red turbans on the streets of Shanghai in the 19th and 20th centuries. They formed such an integral part of the landscape that till today, Chinese movies and comics have these turbans as part of the background, now caricatured in diminutive terms, nevertheless indicating a lasting response to their presence. A brief background to who the six are and how they landed in Shanghai as British compradors. Sikhism was started by Guru Nanak as a reformist spiritual movement in the 15th century in Punjab. Under the next nine gurus, the community grew but also got into conflict with the foreign Mughal establishment, leading to their revolution into an anti establishment martial identity. The Khalsa martial identity ascribed gendered symbols of the male body, which among other things involved keeping unshorn hair and wearing a turban, which made them visible symbols of masculinity. It also involved allegiance to a martial culture, heavily laden with heroism and focused on fighting for justice, particularly to defend Sikh religion and its institutions. It also had deep egalitarian leanings rooted in Sikh philosophy. In the hundred years after the death of the 10th Guru, Sikhs retained the Khalsa identity, but worked as mercenary warriors, looting and plundering areas where they fought, loyal only to groups based around kinship ties. Ranjit Singh, leader of one such group, brought them together in 1801 to create the powerful Sikh Raj. The last bastion of resistance to the British west of Satluj it eventually fell largely due to internal factionalism and was annexed by the British in 1849. The defeat and the disbanding of the fierce Sikh warriors was a big blow to their proud masculine self-image. Ironically, soon after, the British succeeded in militarizing this Sikh martial identity and used it to further their colonial interests across the world. They, were, they also drew their police force from the same pool to use in Southeast, use in Southeast Asia, where they were expanding their trade interests. The Sikh British Association was riddled with compromise. Ideologically, the Sikh martial identity was created to fight state coercion. Working for the British meant enabling a foreign power's coercive agenda against weaker nations, including their own. Besides, fighting for the people by whom they had been humiliated was a contrast prediction in itself. For the British too, including the Sikhs into their military establishment after defeating them in battle, seemed contradictory to military sense. These 
these contradictions seem to have been minimized by mutual benefits. For the British, trained Sikh soldiers would have been a greater threat if left unharnessed and disgruntled. The agrarian background of the disbanded soldiers would also have directly impacted revenue collection in Punjab. These factors were further bolstered after the 1857 mutiny by Bengali and upper caste Hindu soldiers in the British army. To break their monopoly, six seemed an ideal choice. The British therefore began constructing and eologizing the six as a brave martial race to dent into their rancor and also to offset the rebels as ineffective and effeminate. While this helped them create the required dissensions, it also showed the six a way of retrieving their hyper-masculine identity in the only legitimate manner in the given circumstances. Joining the British Army also promised better money, land grants, and perks of service, which their financial position, while their financial position was deteriorating due to British agricultural and succession laws. What would emerge only retrospectively was that the image of the Lions of Punjab cultivated to entice the Sikh soldiers was in reality a ploy to control of people whom their ethnographic studies described as slow-witted easy to control, temperamental, but loyal. This paper looks into the little known history of Sikh policemen derived out of such a background and deploy it in faraway Shanghai in China during the 19th century. In 1842, British won the first opium war against Chinese monarchy. And with the Treaty of Nanking, five ports, including Shanghai, were opened to international trade. They also wrangled land concessions just outside the walled city of Shanghai. Soon the Americans and French followed. Local Chinese uprisings in the walled city also led to a large number of Chinese refugees flooding into these foreign concessions. The growing need to regulate civic structure led to the formation of Shanghai Municipal Corporation in 1854. In 1863, the British and American settlements combined to create the Shanghai International Settlement under the SMC. The need to control the Chinese population, effect arrests, and bring them to trial also led to the formation of a police force. Initially composed of Europeans, mostly Britons, it also inducted the Chinese after 1864. In 1884, at the behest of a British officer who had worked with six, the Sikh riot police was recruited from the Ludhiana Regiment from Punjab in the background of the Chinese Taiping Rebellion against existing King monarchy. Less expensive than the European forces, more dependable than the Chinese, the Sikhs were to become the predominant face of Shanghai Municipal Police for the next 60 years. The rarely told story of these six is limited to broad events and timelines around their arrival, their policing roles, and their eventual departure from China. The undercurrents which define their presence in Shanghai have been less focused on. This paper looks into their aggressive negotiation and utilization of the British colonial structure for their own interests. It also reflects on how the compromises inherent in their association with the British eventually impacted their self-image and the irreparable ruptures which were created by the underlying contradictions between their original martial identity and the British militarized identity. Armed with heavy sticks on roads, with bayonets and guns outside prisons, riding horses as riot police, the bearded and turbaned six became symbols of British control over the Chinese. Their big built and red turbans induced fear the Chinese called them Hong Tao Eson. Ostensibly, Eson meant I, sir, but in the Shanghai dialect, it also meant number three, possibly a reference to the Chinese choosing to see the Comprador's as the last rung in the hierarchy between the British, the Chinese, and the Six. Their most visible presence was on the Shanghai Bund, the waterfront of the Huangpu River, where most of the business houses, banks, and financial centers were located. They regulated traffic, checked drunkards, intervened in fights, paid more than their Chinese counterparts. They also wielded more clout than them on the locals. Cao Yin, in his book, From Policemen to Revolutionaries, A Sikh Diaspora in Global Shanghai, 
tells us that the Sikhs in Punjab discovered huge financial benefits of police service in Southeast Asia and began to prefer it to army enlistment. He cites records to show that in 1901, while the Indian army paid a salary of 84 rupees per year, Singapore paid 272, Hong Kong rupees 377, and Shanghai rupees 525 per year. While Shanghai became the preferred destination because of limited vacancies, others flocked to Singapore and Hong Kong police. Those who could not find jobs in the police started doing other things like joining the milk industry or working as security guards. Gradually, gurdwaras, sick places of worship, began to appear at various places. Kinship connections, religious loyalties, and a common ancestral background led to the creation of a substantial Sikh network. Sao Jin quotes Tony Ballantyne to suggest that Sikh diasporic network was a web that not merely linked the Punjab with specific overseas settlements, but also connected various settlements with each other. Sikh migrants frequently moved from one area to the other. Forts and gurdwaras as meeting points during transits made knowledge exchange easy. The Sikh policemen in Shanghai made use of these networks to extract maximum benefit from the British structures. Having undergone training in arms, anti-riot drills, and learned Chinese and English, they were equipped for absorption in any of the southeastern police forces, each vying to recruit them. The network made it easy for each group to know what their Sikh counterparts in other areas were being paid. Any raise in one area led to no option for the British, but to raise salaries in other areas too. The enterprising Sikhs could deliberately indulge in rowdy behavior to get themselves disqualified from a lesser paying police force to join a better paying one. In 1901, SMP had to raise salaries of the Sikh policemen, for they came to know of a raise in the Hong Kong police, which in turn had been inspired by a raise in the Singapore police. According to Sao Yin, the Shanghai Municipal Council too used its colonial network for understanding Sikh needs and creating highly customized facilities to keep the Sikh staff satisfied. They were provided separate accommodations, given access to the government hospital for their frequent health problems, and provided Punjabi food cooked by a special cook to keep their nutrition levels high. They were also allowed to bring their families to the international settlement. Sikh policemen got away with many insubordinations too. Alcohol consumption had always been rampant in Punjab because heavy physical work in the fields was followed by equally heavy drinking. And they brought this to the settlements with them. Uh, in fact, uh, a social survey in Punjab showed that 100 Jat Sikhs could consume 5 gallons of spirit per year as against the provincial average of 2.25 gallons. While one of their jobs in Shanghai was to check drunkards, they were often found drunk themselves. There was also the problem of clashes and rivalries between Sikhs from different parts of Punjab, particularly Maja and Malwa. In any altercation, all men of one region would get together, leading to mass punishments, including arrest. However, unwillingness to stir anti-British sentiment among Sikhs and to avoid losing big batches of experienced Sikh constables led to frequent pardons. Like in all police forces, Sikh policemen indulged in extra-legal activities like intervening in local fights for monetary considerations and extracting protection money from Chinese traders. When discovered, they were punished, but always with leniency. There were social crimes too, like in the case of Atma Singh, who killed another constable on suspicion of having an affair with his wife. His death sen sentence had to be commuted to a life sentence. By 1907, Shanghai had nearly 856. Other than the police, they worked as guards at banks, in nightclubs, and in hotels. The city, other than being a trading and financial hub, by now had a huge presence of European and American sailors, Russian refugees, and many others. It also include, included infamous entertainment areas dealing with opium, gambling, prostitution, and gang wars. As law enforcers, six found themselves in a powerful position. Ria Almeida, in her article on Shanghai Six, 
quotes journalist Ralph Shaw from his book, Sin City, saying every other Sikh had a sideline money lending. Sikhs were seen as the ruthless lenders, charging exorbitant rates of interest and being harsh on those who defaulted, many of them being Chinese. Worry of these insubordinations, the officers looked for ways to rein in the maverick Sikhs. The British were well aware of the Sikh rootedness in religion and had already utilized it to control them in the army. In 1906, the SMC sanctioned a plan to build a Gurdwara in Shanghai and helped constructing the two-floor structure in North Shizwan Road. The British hoped that religious teachings would regulate the conduct of the Sikhs in police and outside. The Shanghai Gurdwara gradually became a center for assembling for Sikh policemen and also a social hub for their families. Ironically, later, it would also be the center of subversive activities to dislodge British power. The first inklings of unrest among the Sikh soldiers began when they discovered that preferential treatment for Sikhs did not go beyond their immediate use for the colonial masters. At the turn of the century, they discovered that the West offered even higher monetary returns than the Southeast. In Shanghai, it was reported that many Sikhs resigned in order to go to Siberia or North America for better payment. Since the SMC only allowed 20 Sikh policemen to purchase their discharge yearly, some Sikh constables deliberately undertook misconducts to get dismissed. However, they were soon to realize that their celebrated Sikh identity within colonized India would be subjected to extreme racial discrimination within white territory. The 1914 Komogata Maru incident clinched the opinion. British-owned Canada, British Canada created legal restrictions to prevent Indians, particularly Punjabis, from entering its boundaries. Gurdit Singh, a Sikh, already an immigrant, attempted to circumvent the new rule by which only a journey without a break could take Indians to Canadian shores. In 1914, he hired Komagata Maru, a Japanese ship carrying 376 passengers, which sailed from British Hong Kong via Shanghai, from where it picked up more Sikhs, to Vancouver in British Columbia. Of the 376 passengers, 337 were six. Only 24 out of the total number were admitted to Canada. The rest were returned to the Bajbaj port in Calcutta, where 22 of them were shot dead by Imperial British forces. The Canadian press, through this course, caricatured the six, depicting their beards and turbans as evidence of a cultural threat. The ensuing discontent and anger led to many among the most trusted force of the British turning against them. In January 1914, Gurdit Singh publicly espoused the Gadar cause while in Hong Kong. The Gadar movement was an organization founded in 1913 by Punjab residents and the of the United States and Canada to fight for Indian independence from British rule. Hence, Henceforth, Shanghai became an important connecting point between Gadar activities in the West and India. Sikh community networks and Gurdwaras were used to further Gadar propaganda. Many ex-policemen in Hong Kong and Shanghai worked to recruit for the Gadarites. The socialist leanings of the Gadar movement intertwined with the ideology of the international communist movement. In Shanghai, this translated into support for the Chinese nationalist revolution against monarchy. The Gadar ideology steadily gained ground among Sikh policemen in SMP. There were dissensions within the Sikh cadres in Shanghai over the growing Gadar influence. Those who remained loyal to the British lost respect among the community. The most well-documented case is that of Buddha Singh, a Jamadar in SMP, and treasurer of the local Gurdwara, who forwarded the names of seven Gadar, Gadar party members circulating the seditious Gadar newspaper to recruit and transport Sikhs from Shanghai to India. Buddha Singh also used his position in the Gurdwara to pass a resolution expressing Sikh loyalty to the British Raj. His efforts got him the coveted title of Sardar Sahib from the British but also made him a traitor in the eyes of the Sikhs. 
Twice he was assaulted by ex police Gadarites before being shot dead on 6 April 1927 by Harbant Singh, a Gadar party member, in front of the central police station of the international settlement. The British tried winning back the sick policeman with improved salaries and living conditions, even as they built trans regional surveillance networks to check Gadar activities, but things could never be the same again. The 1918 Brit British East India Sedition Committee to Investigate Revolutionary Conspiracies in India was already talking of Sikhs as dangerous to the whole fabric of order and constitutional rule if captured by inflammatory appeals. Gajinder Singh, a Sikh scholar, notes that one major, A. E. Barstow, was entrusted with the task of revising the original handbook on Sikhs, and he said that Sikh religious martiality had a tendency to fall into ideologies like Bolshevism. Sikh policemen in Shanghai were probably beginning to be seen in the new framework too. Meanwhile, many other things increased the ruptures between the Shanghai Sikh policemen and their British officers. The settlement was increasingly troubled in the build-up to and aftermath of the 1926 Chinese Nationalistic Revolution. In May 1925, Sikh policemen, along with their Chinese counterparts, were ordered to open fire on a Chinese group trying to enter police premises. They were asking for support in their fight against Japanese cotton mill workers. Many Chinese policemen refused to report for duty thereafter. For the Sikh policemen, the similarity of their situation with the 1919 Jallianwala Bagh episode in Amritsar in Punjab was too stark. In Amritsar, British officers had made the Indian forces open fire on a peaceful crowd composed largely of Sikhs, leading to the death of more than a thousand people. Sikhs in the armed forces had been particularly shaken by the incident. By 1930, a large number of Sikh policemen had resigned from the Shanghai police force. In the build-up to the Second World War, Japanese propaganda created further discontent. Japanese depicted the use of Indian policemen and soldiers to man British colonies as exploitation. Posters depicting the Jallianwala Bagh incident were airdropped in areas of British de deployment to incite Sikhs in particular. In the 1941 Malay invasion, the Japanese won against the British. Many Sikh prisoners of war from the British army already influenced by propaganda and facing a choice between joining them or being killed, chose the former. One of them, Captain Mohan Singh, started the first Indian National Army with Japanese help, which would later be taken over by Subhash Chandra Bose. These developments must have filtered into the Shanghai Sikh police ranks and furthered the uncertainty about their role as British conduits. In 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army attacked Pearl Harbor and soon after entered and occupied the international settlement of Shanghai. The British and American troops surrendered without a shot. The police came under Japanese control. Many British officers were arrested as political prisoners, but the foreign branch was made to continue in their posts. In 1943, Britain relinquished its rights over the settlement with the, relinquish, with the Extraterritorial Rights Treaty, and it confirmed the abolition of the international settlement. In 1943, uh, the Japanese handed over the area to the Chinese. The history of Shanghai Municipal Police ended in 1945 when the Indian police unit was formally disbanded. The history of the municipal police, uh, sorry, among the small number of Sikh policemen left in Shanghai, most returned to their villages in Punjab. Many of them uh, later moved to the West. Some also chose to make adjacent places like Hong Kong and Singapore their homes. A small handful who had married local Chinese women stayed in China even after the communist, Chinese communist takeover in 1949. Most of them left too after the Sino-India War of 1962. The story of the red turbans of Shanghai has not found its due place in history. The Indian nationalist narrative perhaps found it difficult to explain their role as British compradors. Moreover, many small fights for independence like the Gadar movement and the role of Sikh policemen in it 
got subsumed into the larger nationalist narrative. The British colonial narratives had no place for subalterns, particularly those who caused embarrassment by turning against them. The disjunctions and ruptures that always underlined the ostensibly strong connection between the British and the Sikhs would make an interesting focus for future research. Martial masculinity rooted in religious tenets and backed by cultural affirmation is different from a military masculinity disciplined within an institutionalized set of practices and behaviors. The British tried to appropriate the former for the latter and the six willingly assented, perhaps not just for the financial benefits, but also for remolding themselves into the mercenary warrior image. Did their masculine self-image trap them into making this choice over other choices? What compromises did the choice entail? How did it reflect on their self-image, their place in the family structures, and their relationship with the non-militarized components of the Sikh community? To study the martial race theory as a tool of social control and to contextualize the red turbans of Shanghai within it would yield interesting insights. Akriti Kohli talks of the British casting the martial races in the image of the West muscular Christianity, but never allowing that image to grow to the stature of the British. The multiple competing masculinities with which the Sikhs contended must have created conditions not captured in military handbooks or army journals. Their position of power as the arm of the British, running parallel to their own subordination to the British officials, its contentious relationship to their proud Khalsa identity and its impact on their self-image would also be interesting areas of study. I hope future research focuses on these angles and draws the story of the red turbans of Shanghai into the broader diaspora stories. Thank you. So um, I will, uh, let me take you through some of the slides. This is uh, Shanghai, uh, and this is the picture on the left is the international settlement in Shanghai, and the picture on the right is the Bund, the Bund area where most of the financial institutions, the banks, etc., had been situated. And in both these areas, Sikh presence was very, very prominent. These are some of the Sikh soldiers uh, in their various duties in Shanghai. So you can see the bearded, the turbaned identity, which had been further consolidated by the British because they thought that was the best way of keeping these men in rain. These were the winter uniforms, uh, the big black coats. And this is again, you can uh, see like the mixed uh, police force in which there were the Chinese, there were the Sikh constables, and there also were uh, Europeans and British in the force. This would be the riot police uh, because they, they were given the horses. These are pictures of uh, Sikh constables regulating the traffic in the international settlement. Again, the same rule. These are the pictures which still cause uh, a very negative response from the Chinese. This is the picture of a Sikh family with probably a Chinese girl looking after the children of the family. The Gurdwara, which was constructed by the British in Shanghai and how it became a cultural center for the families of the uh, Sikh constables in Shanghai as well as for them. 
this is how the gurdwara looks currently it is occupied by chinese families and i believe it is in a dilapidated condition it is no longer a place of worship although there are other gurdwaras in shanghai now because of uh, people who've gone there for business purposes etc they have built small gurdwaras but this original gurdwara is no longer a place of worship so this is the representation uh, you know, in cartoons etc and in many movies also uh, here you don't see the red turbans in movies they are shown with a red turban this is a recent picture of my daughter who was in shanghai a few years back and she saw this cut out and sent a picture back home she was very intrigued by it and so was i so i think this is one of the things which got me looking into the entire thing so that's it thank you thank you very much uh manpreet and a very big hand to dr manpreet yeah uh, uh...